On October 22, 2025, a family of four took off in their Robinson R66 for what should have been a simple evening flight in Montana. But near the Chalk Buttes, the helicopter suddenly disappeared from radar after a brief radio call and a small scenic detour. We know the flight ended in a crash. What we don't know yet is the exact chain of events that led to it. The preliminary report is just out, so now let's walk through it to see what it tells us and what the early evidence points toward. Let's begin with the context of this flight. The pilot was 37-year-old Zachary Bailey, flying his wife Kelsey, 35, and their children Vada Rose, 12, and Samuel, 7. Their 10-year-old son Finn was not on board. They departed about 1818 Mountain Daylight Time from a private ranch south of Ekalaka, Montana. They were flying in company with a friend in a Cessna 182. The friend asked the helicopter pilot if they would fly direct to Ekalaka Airport. The pilot replied they planned to fly over the Chalk Buttes first. The Chalk Buttes sandstone outcrops rising roughly 400 to 700 feet dashed above the surrounding prairie. Rugged terrain, few lights after dusk, and dramatic topography. The two aircraft flew in loose formation, the helicopter approximately one-eighth of a mile behind the Cessna and at about the same height as the tops of the Buttes. As they entered the southwest end of the Buttes, the helicopter pilot announced they would fly around the set of buttes off our left. The friend in the Cessna watched the heli fly through a rock gap, make a right turn toward him, then drop back to about half mile to one mile behind. A minute later, the helicopter's ADS-B signal disappeared and radio calls went unanswered. This flight is normal on the surface, a family in a capable machine, scenic route, good weather. Yet by flying low over rising terrain at dusk, margins were already narrow. A witness, located roughly three quarters of a mile southeast of the eventual site, heard the aircraft pass overhead and looked north-northwest. She observed the helicopter flying low over the buttes from left to right, with the Cessna trailing. Then something came off it. She said something detached from the helicopter. She watched it clad a little, attempt to climb, and then disappear behind terrain. There was no visible fire or explosion at that time. When the investigators arrived, they found the main wreckage at 3,779 feet mean sea level, resting on its left side, oriented about 93 degree. The debris field stretched roughly 300 by 300 feet, with components like doors, plexiglass fragments, the tail rotor drive shaft cover, vertical and horizontal stabilizers, and the tail rotor assembly scattered ahead of the main wreckage. Here's what jumps out. The presence of large structural components away from the fuselage suggests an in-flight separation, not purely impact breakup. The fact no fires reported also leans away from an explosion or fuel ignition scenario. Early statements from the investigating agency, the National Transportation Safety Board, NTSB, indicate they are considering in-flight, structural, or component failure at low altitude as a possible factor. When something in flight detaches doors, stabilizers, tail rotor assemblies, it instantly disrupts aerodynamics and control authority. In a helicopter, loss of tail rotor thrust or stabilizer effectiveness means yaw control is compromised. Loss of tail surfaces can also induce violent rolling or yawing moments. So, the witness report plus debris field suggests the sequence may have started before terrain contact and not simply a controlled descent into terrain. Now, about the pilot. Zachary held a commercial pilot certificate with an instrument rating and a second-class medical. According to public records, he was experienced, not a rookie. He was flying what on paper was a very capable machine, the Robinson R-66 turbine helicopter. The R-66 is a five-seat, single-engine turbine helicopter with a two-bladed main rotor and tail rotor. It uses a teetering rotor head, meaning the rotor blades pivot together around a central hinge, the teeter point. This design has some particular handling characteristics. Here are two technical points relevant to this accident. First, low G flight and mass bumping. In helicopters with semi-rigid teetering rotor heads, like the R66, a sudden reduction of loading on the rotor disc, a low G condition, can cause the rotor disc to become unloaded and lose its ability to resist rolling moments. The Australian Transport Safety Bureau, ATSB, reported a case with an R66 
where the helicopter broke up in flight just 3.5 seconds after a turbulence-induced low G roll to the right. Second, the horizontal stabilizer empennage on the R66. Historically, the R66 has used an asymmetrical stabilizer that produces a right rolling tendency in certain conditions, especially when the main rotor is unloaded. Robinson now offers a symmetrical version to reduce that risk. Why does any of this matter here? Because the helicopter was flying low and fast near ridges in fading light, trying a scenic maneuver. Imagine the helicopter banking or turning through a narrow gap with uneven lift loads, potential turbulence. If the rotor disc becomes partially unloaded, the tail surfaces may not function as intended, the stabilizer may impose a right rolling moment, the pilot reacts quickly, maybe instinctively, with left cyclic, and in a teetering rotor system, the result can be catastrophic. Mast bumping, blade strike, structural failure. I want to emphasize that we do not know this happened in this crash. This is not a confirmed cause of the Montana accident. But what is clear is the R66 design has known vulnerabilities under certain conditions, and they may be relevant when you see a scenario like this. Low altitude, maneuvering over rising terrain, fading light, component separation. From the human side, even a highly rated pilot is subject to dynamic conditions. In a family flight, scenic route, daylight, turning to dusk, and another aircraft nearby, in formation there may be additional pressures. Keeping the family comfortable, staying visually in trail, satisfying the guest experience. All benign in themselves, but they can subtly increase cognitive load. The pilot may be sharing story time with his kids, looking for the best view, when the rotorcraft demands undivided attention. Now that the prelim is out, investigators will focus on one big question. What exactly started going wrong before the helicopter hit the ground? With major components found away from the main wreckage, they'll be trying to figure out which piece separated first and whether that separation was the cause or just the result of a sudden loss of control. They'll also go deep into the control system. If any part of the tail assembly, rotor system, or linkages shows unusual stress or failure patterns that can tell them whether the helicopter was still under controlled flight loads or already in an unstable attitude when things began to break apart. On the human side, they're looking for anything that might have affected the pilot's reaction time in the last seconds, maybe workload, maybe a quick attitude change, maybe something unexpected that didn't leave much time to correct. So what can we take away at this early stage? Just this. When a rotorcraft shows signs of coming apart before impact, the margin for recovery was basically gone. And it's a reminder for all helicopter pilots that even on routine flights, anything that disrupts rotor loading or stability can escalate incredibly fast. The final report will tell us the full chain of events, but for now, the early evidence already points to how quickly situations can turn when the aircraft is operating close to its limits. As more information becomes available and the NTSB releases its final findings, we will revisit this case. Thank you for watching and fly safe.